Okay, I just want to give a brief background of where we are in this book, written to the first Corinthians, and I don't want to turn there necessarily, but in Acts chapter 18, we get the history or the background of this church. Paul had recently come from Athens, and he went to Corinth, and I think Pastor John has done an um, introduction talking about how evil and nasty of a city Corinth was, so we didn't want to get into that, but Paul spent 18 months in Corinth, a year and a half, and you can read that in Acts chapter 18 if you wanted to remind yourself what happened in terms of setting up the church. You, you remember Priscilla and Aquila? They were Jews that had come from um, Rome. Claudius the emperor had kicked all the Jews out and they went to, ended up in Corinth and Paul met them and spent 18 months there teaching and starting a church. <laughs> and then as was his pattern, after he started a church, after he appointed elders, he left. He went somewhere else, started another church. And that's when the problems began for the church of Corinth, because what happened is their usual Greek ideas and ways of life kind of started to filter into the church, and they started mixing God's wisdom, God's truth, with worldly philosophies. Um, Greece was the center of philosophy. You may have heard of a few of their famous philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and they were basically gathering disciples, gathering people around them to expound their teachings, and then they would go all over the place, and there were itinerant philosophers everywhere. So that got mixed in with this godly stuff that Paul had been teaching for 18 months. And it created a mess, and it created confusion, it created division, and so there was a problem. <clears throat> I have entitled this message, Hidden Wisdom, because God has revealed to us certain truths. He's put it in His Word, and sometimes it's readily, readily available to read and know, and other times it's hidden, and you kind of have to do a little digging. You have to spend some time in Scripture and understanding what God has said. And so this passage that we're going to look at today deals with all this hidden knowledge that God had imparted, but that no one knew about. But before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. Lord, we thank you for your word, this love letter that you have written and sent to us, and that we can freely, in this country, we can freely read and study, and we can gather in buildings and study and hear your word proclaimed. And Lord, it's like listening to your voice out loud when we hear someone speaking from the pulpit, telling us, teaching us what you have written down. And it's, uh, it's a privilege to have that. I know there are many people around the world who don't have the freedom to open your word, to read your word. Uh, and to them, it's all hidden. I pray your hand of blessing upon them, that they would hear the truth in some way, that some passing person or someone smuggling in a Bible would get them the truth. But I pray that you would take our hearts today and you would open our minds to your truth that you have hidden, you have concealed for your purpose, for your glory. And Lord, may you be glorified by it and may it be your words spoken through me and not me myself. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so basically we can say that the gospel is the wisdom of God. The gospel is the wisdom of God. And if you stop and you think about the gospel, you can break it down into a couple of little things. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was crucified, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. That's really the nutshell of the gospel. Uh, when other people try to add things to it, like, oh, feeding the poor, or you know, getting modern things and, and, and having lots of money, that's not the gospel. 
So just be aware that the gospel, is, in a simplest form, is just it's the story of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that God sent Jesus to die in the place of sinful men so that we could have a relationship with him forever. And that's great. So, Paul was sent by God to speak this truth. He was a missionary. He was one that was sent by God, among others, to, to teach the truth to a lost and dying world. But the inter interesting thing is that true wisdom that God wanted to impart, it takes maturity. It's not just something that the casual observer can pick up, the unsaved can pick up, because they don't have the, um, the discerning mind, the spiritual heart, the, and also the willingness, perhaps, to, to search the scrippers, scriptures. So the unsaved man or the natural man cannot understand the Bible. There are many passages that deal with that, and um, maybe look at one or two here. So, when we think of the wisdom of God, we could break it down, not just the gospel, but the whole idea of, of creation, redemption, um, God's eternal plan for the world. All of those things factor into what we would call wisdom of God. So, as I said, the natural man, the unsaved man, thinks it's foolishness. We looked at, um, John was going through, Pastor John was going through chapter 1, in several places there we, we get the idea that this wisdom this gospel that he's presenting is foolishness to people. They don't understand it. It makes no sense. They disregard it. And um, also you can see, in, if you, um, you're open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, flip over to verse 14. If you haven't opened your Bibles. And it says, but the natural man, in other words, the unsaved man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. So Paul here again is reiterating for us that the gospel and the things of God are considered foolish and foolishness by people, by unsaved. And he goes on to say, nor can he know them, these um, spirit, truths of the Spirit of God, because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, it takes a spiritual capacity to understand these things. Um, let me illustrate. I was, when I was a young man in high school, I had a 65 Mustang, powder blue. I loved it. It was a great car. I wish I, I still had it. It might be worth a little bit of money today. But, you know, as young people, foolish, we don't always hang on to the things of value. And I got rid of it. But to, to finish my illustration, I used to ride around in my car uh, as a like 16, 17 year old kid. And what do you do? You roll the window down, you turn the tunes on, and you know, the wind blows through your hair. It wasn't as long back then as it is now. And you enjoy things like that. Now, about that same time in, uh, in high school, there were friends of mine that would talk about listening to FM radio. I didn't know what FM radio was. I didn't have an FM radio. Um, you know, the, the stories of these DJs late at night, and they would, they would uh, play the whole side of an album, you know, take an hour or whatever, and everyone would listen to this FM, and it was the, it was the latest rage. But I was driving around in my 65 Mustang, and I had an AM radio. That's it, AM. You know, it had one of those on and off switches, volume, Right? And you could change the channels, you could like scroll through the, the dial, or you could even make, have a couple of buttons that you plugged in and you'd push one and it would go to the ch channel that you had selected. And I, I thought that was cool. But, you know, the more my friends talked, the more, hey, FM radio was the way to go. But guess what? I didn't have the equipment. I couldn't, no matter how much I wanted to listen to FM in my car, I couldn't. I did not have the equipment. And the same is true for the natural man. They don't have the means. They don't have the equipment yet to listen to God, to hear his voice, to understand his truths. So, I don't know if anybody can relate to me. Remember AM radio? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, 
in your outline, the number one, Roman numeral number one, to fill in your blank if you're doing that, hidden wisdom requires maturity. Hidden wisdom requires maturity. So this wisdom of God that has been revealed, God didn't design it for everyone. It's not for everyone. It's not for children. Can't understand many of the deeper things. Uh, and certainly the unsaved can't understand these things. So it's, it's hidden. It's veiled. Okay? It's not intended um, to be treated irreverently. And for example, you know, people, you offer the gospel to them and they, they laugh at you and they spit you know, on the ground saying you know, that it's stupid. It, you know, it's not for the unsaved. They don't have the faculty, the facility to understand it. You know, and you've heard the, the verse, do not throw your, cast your pearls before swine. You know, you don't give them the true gems of the gospel and, you know, the truths of God if they're not even willing to confront their own sin and realize that Jesus Christ is the only way. I mean, it takes a step. Once they, they start down that road and they can grow and, and become... Um, grounded in the word. So it's not for unbelievers and it's not for immature Christians, baby Christians. <laughs> there are verses that talk about the fact that um, where you should be teaching others by now, you should be mature. You should be, as a believer, you've been a believer for a long time, the idea is, and yet we need to go back and teach you, just give you milk. You're not ready for meat. So I don't under, you understand that concept that they're not ready to sink their teeth into something really deep. They're only be, you know, able to drink from bottle, drops of, of truth. So this wisdom requires maturity. Okay? It, it, it requires um, a, a vibrant and growing relationship with God, sinking your teeth into it. And when we do, the gateway to God's wisdom becomes open to us. So... In your passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we notice it says, it's interesting, the word in my translation is however. And when I see something like that, a, a however or a therefore, you always go, well, why is it therefore? You know, and so it's referring to something above. If you remember last week, Pastor John was going through uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, and he was talking about uh, Paul's preaching and that it was not based on hu human wisdom. And then he says here in verse 6, however, he says, we preach wisdom. So he's talking about preaching wisdom. I'm having a hard time keeping this on my ear. I have small ears and these things don't fit real well. So this word wisdom here in the Greek is the, the Greek word Sophia. Sophia, sometimes pronounced Sophia, but it's actually an Omicron, so it's a, it's a short O sound. So Sophia, and it means, it's translated here wisdom, but it, it denotes a, a mental excellence, like um, a certain mental acuity, ability to understand. And it has, a, it has a broad scope of meaning, but it generally means having a full intelligence. Okay? Uh, and, but we have to be careful that, that we want to contrast knowledge and wisdom. Those are two different things. Related thoughts, but different. For example, knowledge could be dry facts about something. For example, um, I could have the knowledge of the equation, and maybe you've heard this equation the, of the theory of relativity, E equals MC squared. You guys ever heard that? E equals MC squared. Okay, I have knowledge about it. I can tell you what they mean. You know, energy equals mass times light squared. Okay, so I have a little knowledge of that. Do I know what it means? No. So knowledge and wisdom. It's like facts versus what do you do with the facts? You know, um, we often as young people aren't aware of, of the fact that wisdom takes practice, takes experience, takes time. And now that I'm on this side of the fence, looking back, I realize that um, young people think they're really smart, and, and they are in a lot of ways, technologically and um, socially and all that stuff, but they lack wisdom. 
because they don't know how to apply those facts. So that's something we have to take into account. So we're talking about this is wisdom here. This is not just dry facts, not just knowledge. This is, this is uh, the application of it. This is the, the idea that it... Um, uh, let's see, I lost my spot here. Like natural wisdom belongs to man to a certain degree, and some people are smarter and, than others. Um, but wisdom is something that is acquired, something given by God, something that takes time. For example, um, in Matthew 12, 42, this idea of having variable knowledge uh, being acquired by time and experience, Jesus is speaking. You may have heard this. He says in Matthew 12, 42, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment, in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here now the idea is that Solomon was the rich uh, not the well, he was pretty rich but he was the smartest man he was the wisest man that ever lived and so this woman even though that she was a queen she had uh, power and influence herself and perhaps a lot of knowledge she came a long way to hear Solomon because his wisdom was more profound. He had a certain um, knowledge and experience that no one else had. Now, in Jude 25, we, it contrasts that it says that the supreme wisdom of God is clearly superior to our own. No matter how wise you are, even if you were as wise as Solomon. The verse says in Jude 25, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So no matter how wise we think we are, humanly speaking, we pale in comparison to God. His wisdom is so far above and beyond us. You might compare it with common sense. You know, this whole idea of wisdom, knowledge, is you can have um, facts about things. You could be a brilliant theoretical mind um, in terms of a doctor and mathematics or science of some sort, and yet have no common sense. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Anybody ever heard of Jim Henson? He's a guy who created the Muppets. Jim Henson was actually very brilliant in terms of creativity. But it, it appears that he had a lack of common sense because he spent so much time doing the work on his Muppets and his creations that he failed. He neglected to take care of himself. He failed to eat or take medications. And as a result, he got sick and died. He was brilliant. But he didn't really have it solid in common sense. So where does that leave us? Okay, so verse 6 Maturity needs to be discerned, okay? Notice he says, we speak wisdom, and he sp when we speak it, among those who are mature. Those who are mature. The word here is teleos. It's the Greek word. It means translated mature, but it has this idea of completeness. Um, think of it in terms of physical growth, like a baby. When a baby is born, it's not full grown yet. It's not complete. It hasn't run the whole gamut. And so this word teleos here is talking about this growth, this completeness that must take place. And it expresses um, this, it, it, can, it can extend to a person's mental faculties or their moral character. In other words, you could be um, incomplete emotionally. Um, you could be um, brilliant, but yet not fully understand, fully grasp certain things. You're not mature. Uh, in James 1.4, you don't have to turn there, I can read it, unless you have your Bibles and you want to turn to James 1.4. He says, but let patience have its perfect work. Here's that same word. Teleos here is complete or mature or perfect. Okay? So let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So 
This idea that Paul is speaking here is he's speaking among people that are mature. They're lacking nothing in spiritual understanding. They, they are mature. They are, they are finished. Um, so the idea is that only um, those who are mature, those who are complete, that have grown up, not just physically, but mentally, spiritually, they will understand it. So this obviously has a spiritual um, connotation to it in the book of Hebrews. And we want to look at Hebrews 5, verses 12 to 14. Hebrews 5, verses 12 to 14. Everybody find it? For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the... I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 4. I want to go to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, this is what I was saying a minute ago, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For anyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled, immature, in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So, it takes discernment. To understand, to be mature, to understand this wisdom. That leads us to the, this thought of maturity detailed. We want to like, break it down just a little bit. Because it says, back in our passage, it basically gives us two negatives to, to understand a little bit more about this wisdom. He says... About the middle of verse 6, he says, Among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. The wisdom of this age. So stop and think about it. The thing that, is, that people today consider wise and smart are not things that God considers wise and smart. So there is a difference here. And the word age, by the way, in the Greek is ion. Kind of sounds like this city that's not too far away. It's the Greek word that means age or era. Literally, it means an undefined or unspecified period of time. For example, if I say the church age, you know what I'm talking about? We're talking about a time that the church is here on the earth. It's an age. It's a period. <clears throat> we could say the age of reason, the messianic age. We could talk about, you know, 100 years from now, they'll look back in, in textbooks and they'll say, well, you know, Henry Ford was in the age of the automobile, the automobile age, or the internal combustion engine. So age here is talking about the time or this unspecified period where it has certain characteristics. And you wouldn't be surprised to believe that the wisdom of this present age would constitute the teachings, the knowledge, the beliefs of the people who, who live at this time. And, you know, you'd be appalled, obviously, when you stop and think, what are the things that they, they hold true and they believe? Things like abortion, evolution, false religious systems, and, of course, everybody's favorite, politics. In other words, man-made philosophies, man-made knowledge, and these are entirely flawed and without the knowledge of God. So this wisdom that Paul is dispensing and teaching here is wisdom not of this age. And he goes on to say in verse 6, nor of the rulers of this age. The rule, not of the rulers of this age. Think of the, the intelligentsia, the current leaders, the, the people who are in the know, whether it's sports figures, movie stars. People look up to these individuals, and the wisdom that they spout is not biblical wisdom. Have you ever noticed that? And a movie star or someone, they're accepting their Academy Award. Did they say, praise God, thank you? 
No, they talk about something else, about themselves, about their own particular um, ideas, political bent. So the wisdom of this age is foolishness. It's, it's folly, okay? Uh, so the false teachings, false religions, false agendas, downright lies, that's the wisdom of this age. So don't trust the sports figures and the dark disciples of Hollywood because they will set your life and our lives on a path of total destruction. And they have. And I think we can see it maybe reflected in our day today. So the brainwashing of our youth, I think, best illustrates how God decided to conceal his truth so that they would, they would be in their own thoughts, their own philosophies, their own thinking, which God said is foolishness, but they would reject his thinking, his wisdom, which they say is foolishness. So one person is right and the other one's wrong. They can't both be right. The wisdom of this age or the wisdom of God. Both of them cannot be right. <clears throat> Romans uh, 2, 5, and 6 says, talking about these false religions, false teachings, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So people who deny God's wisdom have nothing, have, they want nothing to do with God, they're storing up wrath. You know, it's like, think of it having a bank account filled with wrath. And that's, and eventually that wrath is going to be um, judged and one day, and they will have to account for it. Now, the last phrase of this verse 6, it says, not, so it's not the wisdom of um, the age, it's not the wisdom of the rulers of the age, because the rulers of this age are coming to nothing. Coming to nothing. This Greek word here is, is katargeo, and it means to, ma to be made or rendered entirely idle or useless. These people, no matter how much they talk, no matter how much wisdom they think they have, they're coming to nothing. They're full of bluster, but nothing. I think a good illustration would be, uh, you know, think of a, a powerful machine, a, uh, a souped up car, and it's sitting there, and it's revving, and it's loud, and you've got this, you know, I, I can't really, I'm not a mechanic, so I can't describe all the things that are going on there with the, uh, you know, sound coming out of the, the tailpipe and all that stuff. You may have heard a few people pull up next to you on the street and they're really loud. Well, imagine this. It's, it's revving, 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 revving. But if it's in neutral, it doesn't go anywhere. All that power means nothing. And that's this thought here. These rulers, these wisdom, the people, the guides of this age, with all their bluster, they're coming to nothing. It's a bunch of hot air. It means nothing. So these ungodly rulers will basically be swept away, you know, like a vapor. But the godly, to the godly, the Lord reveals his mysteries, these things that we've been talking about. So we see um, Roman numeral number two in your notes, hidden wisdom reveals mysteries mysteries. Paul says in verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God. Notice there another but. We talked about however briefly or therefore. Here's a but. If you've ever been in any of Sean Green's classes, this is a favorite phrase of his, but God. Because it's like on one hand there's this, but let's contrast it. On this other hand there's this. In other words, this is what is thought, but this is what's true. So Paul says here, but we speak the wisdom of God. So the wisdom, not of this world, not of this age, but God's wisdom. It's his wisdom. And we already saw a verse that talks about he alone is wise. So it's not the man's foolish thoughts. It's not man's flawed ideas. It's not man's futile philosophies. 
Instead, it's we, he says we handle, we, we dispense, we speak God's wisdom. And God's wisdom is a, is a veritable treasure trove of heavenly knowledge, heavenly wisdom that's beyond all of our human understanding. The, uh, the word here, mystery, by the way, is the Greek word uh, musterion. We get the English word mystery from it, but it's not the same thing as the way we think of a mystery. For example, um, when we think of a, a mystery, we think of a murder, a whodunit, a Columbo, or an Agatha Christie. Right? It's something that's filled with all kinds of twists and turns and clues for us to unravel, and like I say, frequently involving either treasure or murder, or both. And so this Greek word, musterion, we get our English word from it, but it has a different idea. Here, the emphasis is on the fact that something has been hidden, something has been concealed, something has been shut away from us and kept from us to see or understand. It, it hasn't been revealed before. That's what this Greek word is stressing. So Paul's saying we're speaking the wisdom of God, but we do it in such a way that it's a mystery. It's something that isn't readily understood or unknown or has not been previously revealed by God. There are many things that, that um, were not revealed in the Old Testament that are revealed today in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. So this, this word has this concept that it, if left alone, there's nothing we could ever possibly do to unlock it on our own, ever. It's not for us. It's not something that we can work out. We can't puzzle it out and figure and, you know, sit down and, and think and God cogitate. It has to be, it's, it's veiled. It's hidden. It might even be right before our very eyes, and we may, might not see it and understand it. So, um, if God doesn't choose to reveal it, it's going to be forever shrouded in mystery. It's going to be um, back in the closet, you know, covered with a dusty patina of the unknowable. So, but God ordained mysteries. He's the one who um, created them. He's the one who decided this is how he was going to dispense his knowledge. So, verse 7, we start to look toward this mystery ordained. In other words, that God planned it, that God designed it, that God decided this was the way it was going to be. Um, and, and oftentimes when you're looking through Scripture and you see this word mystery, it says that these things have been a mystery from ages past, even before the creation of the world. God concealed this. So the mystery is ordained. Now, the fact that this mystery is... Um, not readily available and obvious to people is because notice the next phrase it says we speak the wisdom of God and notice how we speak it Paul says in a mystery in a mystery it's, a, it's an enigma it's a puzzle it's, a, it's shrouded it's unknown and the, the Greek word here is apokrypto uh, don't worry I'm not going to give you a Greek test later I'm just trying to give you the flavor of these means. It means to conceal away, to keep secret, to hide something. Um, it's closely related to the word uh, apocalypsis. And some of you who've had theology or studied Greek on your own, you know that that's the word that we... For example, the book of Revelation is the apocalypsis. It's the unveiling. So you have, on one hand, you have apocrypto, it's hiding it. And on the other hand, you have apocalypsis, which is the unveiling of it. So God has hidden things, but at certain times and in certain ways, he unveils them. Does that make sense? God has chosen to conceal these things. So notice the, the, uh, in verse 7 here, 
We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom. Again, this thought of this wisdom is not readily apparent. It's hidden. It's been concealed. And that's this... Uh, um, my lips are dry. Apocrypto. Got some water here. So it's been hidden, it's been concealed, it hasn't been revealed. And it's God's decision that he, from the past, ages past, he brought it to concealment. He brought it to concealment, okay, because it's, it's God's wisdom. He's put it in a mystery, it's hidden, and he has ordained it. He's the one who's decided to do this. So this wisdom has been... Um, this knowledge, this special um, wisdom of God has been brought to concealment. Now, this word here, mystery, as I said, it appears many times in Scripture. I want to briefly, I know we don't have the time to go into a lot of these things in depth, but there are many mysteries that God has put in Scripture that he has revealed to us in the New Testament. For example... Some of you may be familiar with a passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. And I will just read it. If you want to turn to it, you can. He says, Paul writing to the church of Thessaloniki, he says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. I don't want to get into all the theological implications there, but the thought of there is something which is called the mystery of lawlessness. I think if you look out on our streets over the last six months, maybe you've seen it. The mystery of lawlessness. Paul said it was at work 2,000 years ago. So what do you think it's doing now? It's not just bubbling and s simmering around, which it's been doing for thousands of years. It's erupting. This spirit of lawlessness, this chaos, this anarchy, we see it today. And it was a mystery. It wasn't revealed before. In, in Colossians 4, 3, we hear about the mystery of Christ. Christ himself is a mystery. Paul says, quoting Colossians 4, 3, Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. In other words, exactly how the Messiah would come to be, who he would be, what he would um, do, all of those things, some of them were revealed, but the Jewish people were looking for a king who would free them. And guess what? He came as a suffering servant and he died. So Christ is a mystery. It's not something that was readily understood by the Old Testament patriarchs and saints. The gospel itself is a mystery, the mystery of the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, it, Paul says, And for me, he's talking about in terms of praying, and for me that the utterance, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. The gospel's a mystery. Again, like the Old Testament, the, the a Jewish people were looking for a kingdom. They weren't looking for a Messiah who would die and pay for the sins of the world and create a, a church. They didn't understand that. Which leads me to the next point, actually the mystery of the church. Colossians 1, 24 to 26 says, I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery, which has been hidden from ages um, and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So the church was a mystery. Again, the Jewish people were looking for uh, a kingdom, a king. They were not looking for a church. Uh, this body, the Greek word ekklesia, means a called out one, um, called out of the world to be his and united in his body. So the church was a mystery. 
Not only that, that the fact that the church that is primarily today made up of Gentiles, that Gentiles would be fellow heirs with the children of Israel. For many, many, many years, the, the way things were believed is that if you wanted to know God and um, come to God in salvation, you had to convert to Judaism. You had to come to Israel, you had to become a Jew, and then become you know, a son of the commandment, son of the law. But it, and, and Gentiles were left out. But today, it's different. God has revealed this mystery that, that Gentiles are not only part of the church, but they're to come together right alongside the children of Israel, joint heirs, fellow heirs. In Ephesians 3, verses 3 to 6, Paul says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in ages and in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. In the olden days, salvation was only in the Jewish um, temple, you had to come to Israel, you had to convert to Judaism, and then you could be saved, but no more. Now Gentiles, like the olive tree, the scripture talks about, if, if you picture the Jewish um, nation as an olive tree, and branches are the individual people, many have been broken off because of lack of faith, and the wild ones, the Gentiles, have been grafted in. We are fellow heirs with Israel. And not only that, there's a mystery that the church, not only are we heirs, we're also called the bride of Christ. There are um, Gentiles are welcome into the church, and they also, because of belief in Christ, they have a special loving relationship with Christ, and it's close and intimate like a husband and a wife. In Ephesians 5, you know the passage dealing with um, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. And he gets to the end of that in verse 32, and he says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So in the same aspect of husbands and wives and their relationship, that illustrates Christ and the church. We are his bride in a close, intimate way. <clears throat> in the last mystery that I want to talk about in terms of other ones scattered through the Bible is, the, is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 52. And this is the mystery of the translation of living saints. Translation. And I'm not talking about language here. I'm talking about the idea that living people will be snatched up and changed like that instantaneously from mortal, sinful bodies to um, glorified, perfect, and incorruptible bodies. Let me read 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. Behold, Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, in other words, all die in Christ, but we shall all be changed. Notice it says all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah. One day, we don't know when, for sure, we're going to hear that trumpet, and we're going to be snatched up, and we're going to be changed. The translation of living saints. Now, there were hints of it in the Old Testament. You may have heard the stories of Enoch, Elijah, you know, two men that God took, and they didn't die. That's kind of a precursor of what we'll be facing. It wasn't common, but it's a mystery, something that God now is revealing to us. Okay, so obviously each one of those could be delved into in greater detail. We don't have the time to do that today, I'm sorry to say. So we'll go on. So this knowledge then, as we've been talking about, has been ordained by God, okay? Built, constructed by God. So you see that in the end of verse 7. Which God ordained. 
So he built this, he, this complex, if you will, of mysteries and, and hidden wisdom. So God ordained it. He's the one who planned the gospel. He's the one who designed the way of salvation. He's the one who authorized the way that history would unfold. We didn't know. We still don't know. The only time that we know anything, like in eschatology, is when he's told us. And we look and we, we try to understand. So he's the one who built this up. It's by the Creator. Okay? God is the one who designed it. God is the one who decided to conceal it. And he did it for long ages. And it wasn't man's desire. It wasn't even Satan's desire. Yes, Satan is a liar and he likes to corrupt things. But it wasn't Satan who hid these things from us. God did. And it's kind of interesting. Why would God do that? Why would he hide things? We'll look at a verse here in a minute that might explain that. So, not only did he ordain it, he ordained it, it says in the end of verse 7, before the ages for our glory. Before the ages, in other words, before creation. He, uh, he brought it about. He bound it up. Okay? Before Genesis 1-1, he made this decision that things would be this way. That he, certain things he would hide in a mystery that we would have to wait for him to unveil them for us. Think of the, uh, the, the word unveiling or whatever, like apocalypsis we talked about earlier. Think of it as, when I was a kid, it used to be a big thing. Um, you turn on the TV and then like uh, Ford or Chevrolet was giving you their new car. And you had this round stage and this car was pivoting on it. Of course, it was covered with a cloth and no one knew what it was. And it wasn't until that lovely lady pulled it off and it was revealed. So that's this idea, this unveiling. God has to do the unveiling for us. He is the one who decided. So he obscured it. The mystery has been obscured. Look at verse 8 now. This mystery that he's been speaking, Paul says, this mystery of God, wisdom of God, this hidden, it's in a mystery, it's hidden. He said, which none of the rulers of this age knew. No one knew it. The people in authority, so they were kept in ignorance. Okay? kept in ignorance. It was obscured from them. And here's the verse that I think gives us a clue or a hint why God is doing things this way. I don't know if you've ever read this, but Proverbs 25 verse 2, it says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. We're going, well, how is that glory? Well, I don't know exactly. I just know that in some way God is going to gain glory by concealing things in a way that he has chosen. From certain people, keeping it from the unsaved, uh, or the immature Christian who hasn't um, had a walk with him and experienced life in Christ and has revealed it to those who are wise. Those who are wise. Uh, the rest of that verse, I didn't write it down, but the rest of that verse says that it's the glory of a king to search out um, a matter. So it's, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of a king or kings to search it out, to, to dig it out. And if we're um, a, a kingdom of priests and kings, then it's to our glory that we search and dig, diligently dig to find these things. Um, you may remember in Matthew chapter 13, famous chapter dealing with parables, the disciples were confused about certain things that were kept in ignorance. So they came to him, if you might remember the story. He, told the, he was teaching the crowd, the multitudes of people in parables. And they came to him, the disciples came to him, and here's what it says in verses 10 to 13. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing, 
they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. So it's God's wisdom to conceal these things. Even Jesus, as I said, spoke to people in these veiled stories. Um, and even some believers struggle looking at the parables. Well, what is he really saying here? And so, um, but Jesus says that to the wise, to his children, to his chosen, he has revealed these things. It's been given, commanded, allowed for us to know. So this, this condition or uh, of spiritual blindness uh, for the Jews back then and for the unbelieving today. Um, it was actually assigned to the Jews. And this stage, if you will, is really only temporary. It's been a long time, a couple thousand years. But eventually, God will pull the veil away from the Jewish eyes and they will come to know Jesus Christ as Messiah, as Savior. And that's, uh, they might have a, a seven-year time period where they're going to go through some rough times first, but through the process they are going to be refined and they're going to come to him. So, the last part of verse 8. None of the rulers of this age knew, right? And then it says, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Stop and think about that for a second. If God had revealed this stuff to unbelievers, they wouldn't have killed Jesus. But would that have been in his plan? He had to die on the cross for our sins. So the glory of his wisdom is revealed in the sense that, yes, in ignorance, um, they crucified him. They crucified him through their incomprehension of his plan. And, but yet that was his plan. In some strange way for a human to think, it's strange. Now, this word here that's in the Greek to know is the word ginosko. It means to perceive. It, it, you know, again, it's not just having just facts about something like uh, I know two plus two equals four. It's like I see what's happening in the world and I know what it means. Does, you understand what I'm saying? It's being able to perceive it. It's to take it and understand it. Okay? To understand, to be aware of, to speak about. In other words, to have enough knowledge about something that you can actually give a discussion or lead a, a discussion to speak about and to have knowledge of a particular thing. So, that leads us to the last verse of our passage today, verse 9. And here we see Roman numeral 3, hidden wisdom reassures mankind. And you're going, well, how is that? How can hidden wisdom reassure us? Well, as we've already looked at some of these mysteries that have been revealed, God has a way of doing things. Uh, and like when he does things in a prophetic sense, he... he Something is prophesied and then it happens. That should reassure us that God's going to keep his word. So this quotation here in verse 9 should also reassure us. Like he said, it's been given for you to know, but not for them to know the mysteries of the kingdom. So God has not kept this truth from his church. He have not, he's not kept us in darkness and so to us, these mysteries are revealed. In Isaiah 46.10, God said, stated that he declares to us the end from the beginning. In other words, he's telling us this is the end, this is the beginning, and all points in between. Not necessarily that it gives us every single detail, but we, we're given a picture. And so it should reassure us. So look at verse 9 here. It says, let's look at this first part here. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man. So eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor enter, have entered into the heart of man. So in other words, we should be reassured by this unimaginable, stuff that we can't conceive. I can't conceive of what heaven's going to be like. Yeah, I can come up with some glorious thing, streets of gold and all that. I don't know for sure what it's going to be like, how marvelous, how much majesty and glory that we'll see. Uh, you know, it's, it's beyond my scope to comprehend. It's unimaginable. And yet, God has promised, uh, you know, 
when we get to the last part of the verse, he's promised these things to those who love him. So the things that our eyes cannot see beyond this life, our ears have not heard. No one's discussed them and never have entered into our own hearts these things. We should be reassured because God has prepared them at the end of there. Verse 9, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. God has prepared a place for us. In other words, we're not an afterthought to him. We are actually a priority. He loves us. He wants us to be with him forever. He's going to take us to a place of unbelievable beauty and splendor. Um, the various houses or dwelling places which are being even now prepared, sometimes referred to as mansions in Scripture. It says that Jesus is even now preparing for us. If you um, want to turn there, John 14, 2, these things that Jesus tells us here should reassure us. So we should be reassured by the unimaginable, and we should be reassured by the unbelievable. And he says in chapter, John chapter 14, verse 2, Let not your heart be troubled. Huh. I hear somebody on television say that a lot. If you watch Fox News, Hannity, he says this a lot. Of course, he's thinking in terms of our world today, politics and how things are going. But Jesus was telling his disciples before he left, don't be anxious, don't be worried, don't be freaked out, don't be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. But it was in the context of, I'm leaving, but I'm going to come back. Let's finish that passage. In my Father's house... Oh, sorry. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He's been working at it for 2,000 years. Do you think it's going to be a uh, wonderful place? I can't imagine. I can't imagine. So. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So when Jesus left, his goal was to prepare a place for us so that when the time was right, he would come back and he would take us to be with him. And it says, we're going to be with him forever. Forever, And so we should be reassured by these things. So that leads us to our conclusions. Wisdom obviously belongs to God. Scripture says that he alone is wise. No matter how smart we are, we do not compare with Christ, with, with God's knowledge, with his wisdom. The smartest men who have ever lived, even Solomon, fall far short of God's glory, his wisdom, his omniscience. And if we are in Christ, if we have a vital relationship with him, meaning we're saved, we're seeking him, reading his word, if we have a vital relationship with him, we're growing we should have confidence that he has revealed his word to us. He has revealed his word to us. What was once veiled and hidden for countless centuries, even millennia, has been revealed. And what even today remains hidden to those who do not know the Lord, to those who are perishing, God has made it known to us. So knowing not only how things are going to end, knowing the last chapter of the book, if you, you want to use that analogy, we know how things are going to end up. We should experience God's truth right now. We should be able to live a happy, confident life in spite of what's going on in our world. I'm not saying that we like everything that's happening, but we should still be happy and confident because we know it's in God's hands. He's revealed it to us.
besides the fact that he is one and we win through him. Okay? Like I said, reading the last chapter of a book, we know what will ultimately happen, how things will end up, and it should give us confidence to live our life and a pleasing life to him. So in understanding God's plan through his word, even just a little, I mean, obviously, there are those of us who are much further along than others. And um, I'm not putting myself in that category. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm still learning. I have a lot to learn. But I, I have a little inkling of what's going on. And having that little knowledge, it should spur us on and encourage us to dig even deeper. I know I'm not, you might think I'm plugging you to come to my theology class. I'm not. But I think you should plug yourself into some study, whether it's personal, whether it's with someone else who can help make you accountable. Um, the women's study, um, Pastor Bill Fox's study on Thursday. Plug into something. This the message that God gave to us is so incredible. Everything he says here is here for a reason, and it's for us to know. He has revealed it to us. Take advantage of what he has given. So I encourage you to read your Bible. Try to do it every day if you can. I know sometimes life gets in the way, and it's t hard sometimes. But try, just even a few minutes a day. And plug yourself, like I say, into some study, some kind of means to grow closer to God. Because uh, even though we may understand that God promises, you know, if you memorize John 3.16, that God promises everlasting life to those who believe, there are two qualities to everlasting life. The one that we usually cash in on is it's eternal. We're going to live forever, never die. And that's great. But there's another factor. It's, uh, it's actually a quality of life. Everlasting life starts now. If you're a believer, it's now and you're plugged into Jesus Christ, he gives a quality of life to us that no one else can understand because they're not plugged into him. And we can experience that quality of deeper understanding, deeper relationship, eternally minded thinking and living right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you have openly given it to us that we might read and understand. I pray that you would just press upon our hearts and give us a desire to read your word, to know what you have said, because it's in your word that you talk to us in the quietness of our heart as we are praying and we hear those answers, not only things that you have said in your word, but those convictions that you um, bring to us. Help us to live a, a confident, happy life in Christ. And I pray that um, this quality of life that we can plug into will be visible to those around us. They will see there's something different about us. And may we then reach out to them and give them the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Not a, not a oh, I hope I win the lottery kind of hope but a confident expectation that we know that we will uh, live with you forever and that even now we live our life to reflect that and people will see and come to you. Pray that you will be glorified. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.